So it's three in the morning and you're in the ED department all on your own. All of a sudden, this handsome 35 year old gentleman walks in complaining of shortness of breath, he's hypoxic, and he's working hard to breathe. So you shoot a quick x-ray and boom, you confirm. He has a large spontaneous pneumothorax. What do you do? I'm Gil Udai, an emergency medicine physician in Toronto working with the EM cases. In today's video, I'm gonna cover some important pearls, pitfalls, and troubleshooting tips on how to comfortably insert your next percutaneous thoracostomy tube, commonly known as the pigtail catheter. Let's move over here. Step one, patient positioning and landmarking. The most common location for putting in a chest tube is gonna be in the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the mid-axillary line. The reason for that being is, this is the area where you have the shortest skin to pleural distance on most people. You have this muscular chest gentleman over here, but right underneath his pec, you have a small area with less muscle and less adipose tissue. So to access this space, first try to get the shoulder over top of the head. For some patients who might have difficulty with mobility, you may want to get a tray table or something else and have the arm extended out in this position. What you're not trying to do is biopsy the spleen or the liver. So if you're trying to locate your fifth intercostal space, most commonly the fifth rib will be at around the breast fold or the nipple line, but just remember that it extends superiorly as you move posteriorly. Right here is roughly the fifth or fourth intercostal space, which is higher than you would expect. Now, for some patients, this might not be the best location. For whatever reason, for whatever reason either from body habitus or because of shoulder mobility, you may want to go anteriorly. Now here, the most common pitfall is going to medially. So remember, we're aiming for the midclavicular line. The clavicle extends all the way out to the acromion. The midclavicular line is actually more lateral on the chest wall than you would expect. Now a nice common tip to locating the second rib is just palpating along the sternum and finding the angle where it meets the manubrium. As you come laterally along the second rib, midclavicular line, you're going to try to put the chest tube in this location right here. Step two is local anesthetic. Now, at this step, most physicians like to use procedural sedation. But truthfully, if you do this properly, you can avoid procedural sedation and do this in a more safe and less resource intense manner. The key, however, is to putting your local anesthetic in the right location and using an adequate amount. Now, once the patient is prepped and draped and you've already landmarked, you wanna make sure that you're going in with your local anesthetic just above the rib into the intercostal space. Remember, your neurovascular bundle runs just underneath the rib. However, there are still collaterals on top of the rib, and so I like to aim even just slightly above the rib, but towards the lower part of the rib space. When I go in with my local anesthesia, I like to go in at a perpendicular angle and just make a little bleb in the skin. And as I advance, I will aspirate and inject, aspirate and inject. Now once I enter the pleural space and I aspirate air, I know I'm in the right spot. It's at that point that I'll pull back just slightly so that I'm in that area in between the innermost and internal intercostal muscles. And that's where I'll inject a significant amount of local anesthesia. So one small little added pearl here is to try to estimate the depth of the skin to pleural, pleural distance when you're inserting your lidocaine. This can give you an idea later as to how far you need to go in with your seeker needle and with your dilator. All right, at this point, I'm out of here. <laughs> so now that we have our patient ready and anesthetized, we're ready to set up our equipment. We're gonna open our chest tube kit and start getting things ready in the order that we're going to use them in. So first, I like to get my seeker needle. I like to make sure that it locks in place with my syringe. After that, we're gonna to need to use our guide wire. And then I'm gonna set that aside. Okay. The next step will involve making an adequate nick in the skin using our scalpel blade. Next, you wanna make sure that you dilate. And finally, we wanna set up our chest tube. So the pigtail catheter comes in with a three-way stopcock already in place. But in order to pass it through the chest wall, you want to insert the obturator all the way to the end and then lock it in place. Now as you can see, the pigtail catheter is no longer curled at the tip and is straight and rigid. 
This will allow you to pass it through the chest wall. Great, so now we're ready to begin the procedure. Similar to before, you want to inject with your seeker needle at a 90 degree angle, just above the rib. And as I advance, I'm going to keep aspirating until I enter that pleural space. At this point, I'm going to angle slightly upwards, but be careful, and just stabilize the needle and remove your syringe. Insert my guide wire. It's all the way in. Now, generally, it would be in a lot further, but on this mannequin, that's as far as we get. Now, this is another common pitfall. When making the nick in the skin, you want to make sure that it's big enough. What I like to do is using my 11 blade scalpel, just go in straight to about one third of the depth and then pull back out. Now the next common pearl is dilating the skin. So now that I can see that my guide wire moves freely and I can insert the dilator past the skin, I need to get it through three different layers of muscle into the pleural space. Now, common tendency is to push as hard as you can, but the risk there is if you advance too, too far in, too forcefully, you may injure some, some internal structures. So one tip here is to try and tear the fascia. To do so, advance the dilator just slightly and start twisting. Now what you're trying to do here, imagine you're wrapping the fascia along the tip of the dilator, and then pull back and you'll feel a little bit of a give. Do that a few times until you feel a loss of resistance and you can comfortably insert the dilator. And that's as far as you'll need to go. But finally, we're ready to put in our pigtail catheter. A few pearls here. So pearl number one, when you're advancing it through the skin, here you have a rigid catheter that you can try to aim more anterior and superiorly. Next is I like to advance it to about the second line. Now this lets me know that my pigtail catheter is far enough into the chest that it's in the, sitting in the pleural space. Now I like to remove the obturator just partially so that I know my distal end is coiled like a pigtail. And now I can advance it safely to about the third line. At this step, I'll remove everything And depending on the size of the pneumothorax, you may want to let the air out more slowly, especially if you're dealing with a larger pneumothorax or one that's been there for many days. You can either cover the hole with your thumb or more easily, just switch your stopcock so that it's off towards the patient. Another common pearl that was given to me by some thoracic surgeons and anesthetists is to provide the patient with an intrapleural block. The idea here is to inject the pivocaine or a longer acting local anesthetic into the pleural space. Again here, the thought is that you're going to anesthetize three or four or multiple different levels of intercostal nerves. The way I like to do it is to aspirate 20 cc's of bupivacaine, 0.25%, so that I know I'm in a safe amount, in a safe range. And then I'm going to come and inject it through the pigtail catheter into the pleural space. So looking at the pigtail catheter, I have to turn my stopcock so that it's open again. I'm going to attach my syringe and I'm going to flush it with 20 cc's of bupivacaine. After I've injected my bupivacaine, like I said, I want to turn the stopcock off. The reason being here is you want to leave the bupivacaine in the pleural space for at least a few minutes to allow it to work. If you connect it immediately to the chest drainage device, you'll unfortunately just remove all of the bupivacaine you just injected. So now we're ready 
to attach the extension tubing and the one-way valve or most commonly used the Heimlich valve. Now one pitfall I have seen here and some of the thoracic surgeons have told me about is that the stopcock can be left in the wrong position. Just remember you want your stopcock to be off to this direction so that it's open and air is allowed to escape through the tube and out the extension tubing. Now when connecting the Heimlich valve, the blue end attaches to the extension tubing. However, if you ever forget, just read the side. Over here, you see that it says flow is flowing in this direction. And that's the direction you want to leave it in. So now we're ready to suture the chest tube in place. I like to use silk sutures and a large size, size zero. One of the most common complications with chest tubes is to have them being kinked or dislodged. And you'd hate to have all of your hard work undone just because of a lousy suture. So another way to confirm that your valve is working, which is honestly my preferred way, is to actually submerge the valve into a cup of water. Now as you can see on this patient, if you get the patient to cough, you can see the bubbling form. Now this confirms that not only that the chest tube is working properly, but also confirms that there is an ongoing air leak. Now the other benefit of doing this is to check for an ongoing air leak when you're considering removing the chest tube. Instead of having to connect it to an underwater drainage device to assess for bubbling, this is a lot simpler. Just remember to properly secure the chest tube placement with adhesive tape to the anterior chest wall. This is to provide patient comfort and to ensure that the chest tube does not accidentally get dislodged. Now, there may be cases where you want to attach the chest tube to a chest tube drainage device, either with an underwater seal, plus or minus suction. Mainly, these are instances where you either have large pleural effusions, large amount of fluid, or unfortunately you're just not achieving re-expansion of the lung with the one-way Heimlich valve. Normally, you'd have an assistant hand you the connection tubing with the aseptic yellow cap on. Remove the cap, attach it to the extension tubing, and then secure it in place with water-resistant tape. In those circumstances where you want to use a chest tube drainage device, you want to turn it around and remove the pre-filled fluid syringe from the back of the device and turn it back around. The key here is to inject the fluid into the right port. We have the suction port and the needleless injection port. You want to inject into the needleless injection port. Once you inject your fluid, you'll see the water turn blue and you know you've done it right. Finally, if you want to attach the device to suction, you want to attach your suction tubing to the suction port. You want to adjust your pressure, which is usually already preset to negative 20 centimeters of water. And then you're going to adjust your suction, your wall suction pressure, until you see the floating device reach this suction line. So we've successfully inserted the pigtail catheter, and now our handsome, and might I say dashing, 35-year-old male is now breathing comfortably once again.